Yeah, so a series of suppliers are starting now to give their thoughts about extractable, leachable 665. Um, maybe a few words to Merck. So I'm Merck Darmstadt, Germany, and we are a big company. We are a supplier on the one side, supplier of, for example, filters, single-use systems, cell culture media, whatever you can think about, lipid nanoparticles, very fancy currently. We are also manufacturer by ourselves. Yeah, so we have the Merck Life Science, we have the Merck Healthcare business. But even within the Merck Life Science business, where I am located, we do have CDMO activities. And me as a regulatory consultant, so I'm still employed by Merck, so consultant does not necessarily mean I'm a freelancer. Um, I'm supporting the business on the one side, but I'm also supporting our CDMO activities who are using single-use systems. I might switch during the talk my mind from a supplier to an end user and back, so please forgive me for that. Um, but this gives me, of course, the opportunity to look into both. Yeah? Requesting from an end user perspective something from us supplier, that's sometimes fancy. Good. I will look again a little bit into the regulatory <coughs> framework, not only 665. And we, I already had the feeling during the panel discussion, we addressed all topics um, which are already important. And I am really looking forward for these two days for continuing these very living discussions. And yes, so we talk about component qualification when we talk about the USP 665. I have the feeling there's a little bit the gap for single-use systems and component selection. And I'm very happy that uh, there's also polymer supplier here um, in that room. So what is the difference? Packaging versus single-use system. I think it's already obvious. If you have, and I took here a very complex packaging system, a prefilled syringe, which might be out of plastic material, maybe you have three, maybe four plastic, various plastic components, but you have big batch sizes or the preferred syringe supplier are manufacturing in, in really big batches, always the same. Maybe they deal with five catalog numbers, I don't know. Single-use systems are customized. We do have sometimes batch sizes of 10 units, sometimes more, but can be really challenging here. We do have filters, tubes, connectors, back films, of course. Uh, we do not have only one tube, by the way. Yeah? We can have in one assembly three tubes, four tube, um, various, com not only in size different, but also in composition different. And then it's already address this, yeah, standardization. Uh, I, we always talk about extractable, it's exaggerated condition, worst case. I would also like to move here more into standard <coughs> conditions. To make it even more complex, and we as Merck, we are not such advanced like GSK, having a very nice strategy, uh, looking, mapping all the components. We are mapping the process, yeah, so, um, each process, and it can be very complex. So just take the left side as a picture yeah, of a process. And we are talking here about um, aseptic processing, so the final filtration, final filling. We did have the discussion of how clearance of, of leachables. Of course, this is more in the drug um, substance manufacturing, but not in the drug product. Here, you may might not have any potential clearance unless extractables adsorb to the filter or so. So I'm not that expert in, in it. But of course, this is a regulatory um, concern, specifically here, this part. So you have bags on the left side, um, then in the middle it is somehow, um, then, then you pull it, you mix it. So this is another single-use system. Then here uh, you have a filter in between and at the very end you have then filling. Um, so you can imagine 
many, many components. Just outline one example of a filtration setup. And yes, we're, it's getting more and more complex. We have requirements from the Annex one, like PubSit, like um, it's not a requirement redundant filtration, but it's getting complex. And just this one assembly already have 10, 15 various materials of construction. So with that, we need to have a more streamlined um, approach than, for example, for packaging systems. Regulatory. There are two ways to look into regulatory. So we have on the one side market authorization and we have on the other side the manufacturing authorization. Manufacturing authorization, this is when the <coughs> GMP inspector is coming on site, um, reviewing your GMP compliance and the manufacturing authorization, this is when you uh, apply basically um, to get your market authorization. And this is, there are various different parties involved uh, where the manufacturing, that's GMP inspectors, the others, here you might have some additional guidelines from the EMA, the European Medicine Agency, and this makes the regulatory quite complex. Uh, it, it's not only the USP665, this is a protocol. Um, this is a standard, it, 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 it's a test. Um, it's not the regulatory requirement per se or the baseline. Um, and we do have the new Annex 1, um, also Etienne Marine, you already mentioned the Annex 1. I copy pasted the same um, here. They all, they have a chapter of senior systems. And this chapter starts, there are specific risks associated with single use systems. So the single use chapter is maybe like this on one page and the extractable is just a little bit. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you because I got a question from the imam. I have the beauty to present in three weeks at an inspector training at the imam where European inspectors uh, will be trained on Annex 1. And I will present a general view of um, single use systems. And I got the question, how does Annex 1 guide manufacturers in assessing and controlling leachables and extractables from single use systems? I was a little bit surprised because I th think they thought they are very innovative um, addressing now this single-use chapter and this extractive leachable. So that's maybe a call for action. Please come to me in, in, in the break if, if, if you have the feeling Annex 1 changed something in your... Yeah, Carsten, I see your... <laughs> I see your silent comment. <laughs> so, but you have this regulation, but is it something new? No. We already had for market authorization this guideline from 2014, um, which also talks about general issues related to single-use equipment. And here uh, it was already mentioned you need to provide information on the nature, amount of potential leachables removal of such impurities. Uh, so, by the way, I like this statement very much because it has everything in what we need to do. Maybe the EMA is kind of more scientific <coughs> based. I think I need to be a little bit careful. This is recorded, yeah? yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we get, okay, good. <laughs> so, data, they also talk here about data, but also about the risk assessment. Yeah. So it's not said low, medium, high risk. It's not said what type of testings you need to perform. For me, that's pure scientific and that's basically all we need to know. So now we are here to talk about the 665 and the 665 is about component qualification. And what's the difference between component qualification and component selection? Let me quickly 
go through the component qualification procedure assessment per 665. I'm pretty sure you are all aware of this uh, here in the room, maybe even much more than I am. But if you read it again careful, and in the beginning, it, uh, the 665 says, okay, there's an assessment process, which is a two-phase process. First, material characterization to support and justify material selection. Second, the component characterization to support and justify component selection. The 665 is not about the first phase. The 665 is about the second part, the component characterization. And here we have Basically, all the steps, components are chemical suited for the intended use. Uh, you need to do the appropriate chemical testing, so the extractable profiling, and of course, you need to do the interpretation. The higher the risk, the higher the level of characterization. We heard this. Uh, we, we saw basically also the uh, requirements, testing protocol. Um, you do an initial assessment. Is my component in scope um, or not? So if, if you have a tube clamp, Theoretically, it is not in scope. We know that it could happen that you also have some outgassing during irradiation. At least we found one case, yeah? so which could also impact maybe then the tube if the tube is clamped with that not in fluid contact. But this is something I do not want to. I don't want to raise too many problems. I do not want to go into that uh, detail here. The standard extraction protocol is for me the most important because I think the risk assessment that is something everybody was already used to. And Dennis, you already mentioned, it is the concept of aiming for the middle. I heard in 2020 a uh, webinar from the USP um, where Desmond Hunt was also presenting and he gave this number, the aiming of the middle, what is the middle? 85% of the cases. Dennis, do you know where this number is coming from? The 85%? It's better than 80, easier. <laughs> <laughs> so if you are lucky, you are within this 85% and then you can apply the standard protocol. Also interesting, if you have more, if you're outside of the 85%, if you have the 15, yeah, so you are in a more exaggerated uh, condition, a more extreme manufacturing condition, then you need to look for an alternative protocol. If you are less aggressive than these model solvents, do the 665. Uh, yeah? So that, that's somehow like it is written in it. So what are we doing? We take our entire process, so at least here, formulation, filtration, filling. Um, that, that's just one part of, I don't know, three, four pages uh, mapping, um, as we said. So we are still mapping process by process. We should could be more streamlined. Uh, we heard a nice example this morning. And then uh, what an end user is doing, um, we, we um, have various process steps. We have various um, suppliers, um, various materials of constructions, certifications. I like this. Take whatever you get and just write it down first. So this is the first step. And then surface to volume ratio, product contact time, temperature, these are then information we need to map because this is something we need to do for our risk assessment afterwards. And we heard about then doing the risk assessment with the 1665. It's not mandatory. It's an informational chapter. All chapters in the USP above 1000 are informational chapters. But you know, sometimes also informational USP chapters could be proposed by authorities. Yeah? If you now compare 1665 and Another one, and I, I'm pretty sure that maybe many of you also applied the Bioform best practice, so which was already published before the 1665. And to be honest, uh, we do apply the Bioform and not the 1665. Why? 
um, if we look into the difference, we talked about some mitigation factors. The Bioforum one has basically at least a part of the mitigation factors already in the distance along the production stream. Yeah, that's not necessarily per se considered in the 1665. You can apply then mitigation factors. And there's also a weight on each um, consideration on uh, the distance along the production stream has a strong weight of 0.4 out of 1. Um, temperature, duration, process, fluid uh, interaction, and the dilution ratio. That's not part of the 1665. Yeah. So if, if you um, track basically what has a low dilution ratio, and that's in the bioform one. And I was also um, surprised, uh, or not surprised, yeah, so, so um, I found it very interesting, uh, the LC survey saying, um, not everybody is doing the 1665, but a kind of mixture. And I think it's, it's fair, it's good, it's proposals. Yeah? You have the Bioform proposal, you have the 1665 proposal. They are not bad, they are both somehow good, but you need to justify what is your best fit. And the USP and, and that was also specifically um, mentioned in Desmond Hans from the USP webinar in 2020. As long as you end up with three levels, that's fine. Yeah? High risk, moderate risk, and low risk. Another difference between 665 and Bioforum um, by the way, I, I did the exercise for, for some examples. Um, what is the difference um, when I run the 1665 risk assessment and the bioform risk? Is, it's not matching all the time. Yeah. So you end up with different uh, levels that can happen. But there are also different expectations or different protocols um, by the bioforum. So now I'm switching now to the supplier end. What should a supplier do? 665 or bioforum? They are almost <coughs> the same. There is, of course, uh, WFI in the bioforum still. And as a supplier, you are doing both typically. Uh, so you, um, you provide data, you provide data um, for your clients to have access to the extractable data. So I heard, was it you, um, I'm in sustainable. We are much more sustainable. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's not a very low carbon footprint. <laughs> we are applying with the extractable still, but yes, we, we are more <coughs> streamlined. We are focusing on the standard extractable protocols. And that was discussed uh, already during the panel discussion. You have the opportunity to compare various suppliers. You have also the opportunity if there is a change, um, if there's a raw material change, uh, if you have um, new sterilization method. Um, now, you, you need to co compare or you have the opportunity just simply to compare is the material, the current one, does it have the same extractable profile than the new one? Yeah, or what, what is the difference? Yeah, so I think this is also for suppliers, but also for the end users, very valuable because then they really can take these data um, of, of a change. And in single use, as we do have many, many, many different components, materials, we need to deal with changes. So supplier documentation, they do have extractable data per Bioform and per USP665. Um, we as a supplier, we need to say we started with the Bioforum extractable data, yeah, the first protocol, by the way, where we did have the sodium chloride, uh, <laughs> polysorbate, yes, so we, we had our challenges uh, by testing 
these model solvents. Uh, then the 665 came out, so we adapted our protocols to the 665. Then the next Bioforum uh, adoption came out. So I think you might face still some issues that you have maybe some suppliers uh, started with the old Bioforum that you have also here variations still. I think it, maybe it will take a time until everybody has the 665 data. So theoretically, you did map your process, you ask your supplier for the extractable data. Last step, you, do your, uh, you are doing your um, patient safety evaluation. So the toxicologist um, identifies, is there any risk? If everything is fine, risk is acceptable, all good. If the risk is not acceptable, you need to go into mitigation actions like leachable testing, um, dilution, f flushing the filter, whatever. Um, so would you do this exercise if you are in the phase to select a supplier? So you have a project, yeah, like I showed the first one, one of the first slides with a lot of material, a lot of assemblies, and now you have uh, Merck, Sartorius, Paul, uh, sorry, Sativa, uh, 3M, so I was just looking, so forgive any suppliers here in the room, which I did not mention, and then you need to <coughs> select, you need to understand already upfront in your project, because extractable, that is something which is performed at the very end of the implementation. Yeah? So you need to understand somehow in the beginning, somehow the material I'm using is safe. Of course, you could say we are using these materials already for years. And we have also in our company that opinion. Yes, we are using safe, but I think it's important that we have regulations behind who survey basically if really plastic used in either packaging or single use or wherever in the process are safe. Yeah? If there is a bisphenol A issue, if they identify, uh, by the way, the bisphenol A, I think all uh, the, the trials uh, or, or all the data are coming from oral intake, not for parenteral. Um, so I'm also not a toxicologist to justify if this can be somehow justified. Um, but I think it's a need. I think it's a need to have a kind of indication how to select a component to be sure at the beginning of my project, I will not end up at the end um, with some toxicological concern and need to start in the beginning. Yeah? A project for implementation, single use in aseptic processing specifically, so in, in a very highly concerned arena can take up to two years, three years, whatever. And you do not want to start from the beginning when you are starting your extractable, when you have frozen your design. Yeah? The USP, and we already talked about this, does not give any acceptance criteria. So sometimes I receive um, or we receive user requirement specification and yet there you get a list of requirements and there you get USP 665 compliant. It is not possible yeah, to say this I am 665 compliant yeah, because with that I would need to know what is your process, what is your contact time, what is your uh, administration um, later on to the patient? Is it a lifetime? Is it a um, just one shot? So NVR is calculated in milligram of 50 milliliter sample and this value needs to be reported. UV absorbance is reported. Organic extract profile. So here acceptance criteria. So I put a lot of text because you get the slides afterwards. So I put the most important I'm calling out here in bold. So focus on this acceptance criteria, organic extractable profile. Yeah. So 
you assess this, you make the data, and it's interpreted. Yeah? It's not only to ask the supplier for the 665 data and you are all set. It is really to be interpreted to do basically the safety, this toxicological assessment. There are no limits given. And I don't know what is the best limit to be given, to be honest. I don't know what is the right NVR. We do have NVR limits in the packaging um, requirements, the 661. There are limits given, 15 milligram in a 50 milliliter sample NVR. I don't know if this makes sense, this value, yeah? but there is a limit. At least you have an indication. <coughs> the 661, and I think many of single use suppliers adopted this 661 in the past. Yeah? What did the single use suppliers 10 years, 20 years ago? We didn't have any standard testing. We just drag and dropped, we copy pasted basically what is available in the packaging um, arena. If it is uh, NVR661 or if it is particles or endotoxin, we are always taking these chapters. I found it quite interesting that uh, and, and in the 2019 draft, there was still these uh, 661, the physical chemical tests included. There were also the biological reactivity included. There was even still the 88, by the way, included. In 2020, another draft came out and here it was to decouple the chapter from plastic materials of construction. So that was one objective of the new, new revision or the change and to clarify the component qualification versus selection. So it was clarified the 665 is not intended to be used for the component selection, for only for the qualification. Not, not only it's an important aspect, the qualification, but it is not to select the component. And they also revised basically um, or, or deleted the, the chemical testing um, like we have for the packaging um, for the packaging container, and they deleted the biological reactivity testing requirements. So this is the difference we are facing today. If you need to qualify a packaging container, you have first the raw material, and there you have standards. Today, the six six one. The 661 will be uh, obsoleted, I think, also 2026, um, if I'm not mistaken. And then people need to switch to the 661.1. These chapters are very similar to the European Pharmacopoeia, the 3.1, and uh, all, all the subchapters. And then you have the today 661, tomorrow the 661.2. Two, um, test the entire component uh, and potentially uh, from the final uh, you need to go into a lead service. Uh, that, this is for packaging. For single use, we have the 665 only. And this is here for the component qualification. I discussed this also that time with Desmond Hunt, so how to interpret, what is about, uh, so should we use the 661.1 in the future to characterize our material we are using? And the answer is, and this is also written in the 1665, use a well-characterized material. Whatever well-characterizes, how can I know? Uh, if, if I'm the process engineer, how can I know, uh, know what is a well-characterized material? Six six five doesn't provide a pass fail test. Today we do have all these packaging material references we are applying. We are still applying this, uh, so we we still have the six six one. We are moving here from the eighty eight to the eighty seven. Yeah, so we, we discussed this biological reactivity. It does not make sense to implant and wrap it a piece of plastic and to look if this rabbit is dying or not. 
um, and but we still do biological risk. Do we need to do this in the future? Do we need to do a kind of physical chemical test in the future? Um, it's not a list what necessarily Mac Millipore is doing. It's just a list collected what could be applied. So next we have the 665, not for selection, later on for characterization. And by the way, we have new chapter, USP 383. I don't know if you heard about this, but this is um, for cured silicone elastomers for pharmaceutical packaging and manufacturing components. And if you read the 665, there is also a comment that tubes are not in scope of the 665, that tubes will become, so there will be a new chapter for tubes specifically. And this is basically the new chapter, which will be official as of 2027. I was comparing to the um, European Pharmacopoeia and there is uh, chapter 3.1.9, which is also about silicone elastomers for packaging. Um, there's also for packaging and there's also tubing mentioned in the, I, I was never sure which type of tubing the European Pharmacopoeia did have in mind, but it's clearly for, you know, we can discuss later on. Um, but um, it's very similar or it's almost uh, basically the same tests here. <clears throat> so do we just need to perform these two tests or provide the supplier data 665? And maybe, yes, we're in 2027, we also adopt the 383 for silicon tubes. For me, it's still a question mark. I will not give you an answer. What doesn't make sense? What doesn't make sense? Yeah, I'm not the, let's say, analytical expert, therefore, but um, I think we need to have something. We need to have something at the beginning of a project to understand is most probably my single use system in, for the intended use in terms of toxicological assessment. So that's not cleared, not in Europe, not in the US. Um, there's no clarification on that. Just the last slide on regulatory and to confuse you at the end <laughs> a little bit more. Um, and, and this is if you have many, many parties involved in providing regulatory guidance, this issue sometimes is coming up. So we have an EMA guideline on plastic and medium packaging uh, materials. So immediate packaging materials, that, that, that's drug product packaging. Yeah. But they also have a decision tree, so they also talk about plastic material, uh, packaging material for active substance. And we know active substance are very often packed and stored in single-use bags. Yeah? So do we need to apply this EMA guideline also for this application, drug substance, packaging, storage, transportation? because here they would require material described in farm oil. This is exactly the 3.1 uh, and uh, subchapters. The USP also has some uncertainties. If you look into the USP 659, and that's my last reference I will give you for today, um, is about packaging and storage requirements. Again, drug product packaging, however, they also indicate the storage distribution of active ingredients, yeah, active substance, drug substance, excipients, and medical products. So medical products are the drug product, but excipients, do I even, if I have this in the plus, do I need to do, what do I need to do? Do I need to comply to 661? Because everything in scope of this chapter needs to comply to the 661 chapters, which includes also, <coughs> by the way, the biological reactivity. With that, regulatory expectations are more or less understand the risk. For you, understand which regulation do I need to comply with? 
do I need to apply? So we, we learned some confusion here. The component qualification, there is the standard testing protocol. And I think for me, at least as a non-analytical expert, I think it's good to have this. Um, I can also understand that regulatories are looking basically into the dossier R665, you know, how happy you are if you do not have an understanding of something where you can just do a check mark. Yeah, so that, that space, I will not say that's a good approach, but of course they need to deal with many, many other um, aspects of uh, the quality of the drug product. However, for me, material selection, that is still open for discussion. Maybe we get some input here, which is a little bit more abroad of the 665, but which is related for me really to the 665. Thank <music> you.